Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT show. As you know, we are now in our second century of uh, the nation talks uh, to a whole range of people across the country and beyond. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. And again, thanks to you, the TNT show and India Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows. We'll have more to tell you about some particularly exciting developments at the end of this uh, interview. So stick around because there's some exciting stuff coming up. You can watch, of course, the TNT show on India Live Net, uh, streamed out on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Plus on YouTube, you can check out all the previous shows. So there's lots to see there with uh, with our second century starting. Well, you know it's been another great day for British democracy. Uh, listen to this one. Allegra Stratton uh, of, of recent fame. You may recall she was uh, Boris Johnson's ex PR manager. She is still the only resignation. And you know something? She never went to a party. <laughs> you know, tonight we are talking to another very special guest. We'll be discussing the state of British democracy and so much else besides. Tonight, uh, we are joined by the co-founder of Open Democracy, Anthony Barnett. Now, Anthony is here for a full hour, uh, and he's taking your questions live. So, if you want a question considered, let us know, and we'll try and answer it as best we can. As you know, The Nation Talks is your show in many respects. We're live, and we're free. So, no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks to Anthony Barnett. Thank you for joining us, Anthony. How are you? Pleasure. Thank you very much. I'm fine. Thank you. Very well. It's very nice to be on a live, a live show, which isn't being videoed or edited or anything like that. It's great. Yes, you're completely live. It's what you see is what you get. <laughs> well, I'm afraid so. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're joining us from I'm Oxford. Too today, closely, right? however. <laughs> you're joining us from Oxford today. I mean, I live in West Oxford. I'm a Londoner, and um, for various family reasons, I've moved out to a very nice house in West Oxford. Unfashionable Oxford. <laughs> Tell us what you do, Anthony, for the benefit of those who, folks who might not. Yes, know. John. Uh, well, um, uh, I would I would say on a day like this is it back in 1988, I helped to start Charter 88, and we said we needed a new democratic constitution because the way our country was governed was rotten and corrupt and uh, uh, just didn't simply satisfy people. We had no rights and so on and so forth. And But I never quite thought it would get to this point. Um, I did think at that point that the British political class was capable of reforming itself uh, before entering such a, a terrible humiliation as the one we're going through. And it's one of the reasons why I now feel uh, it's essential for the English to support Scottish independence. And I say this, many of my co good colleagues and friends are still very, oh, don't leave us with the English. We can't, you know, we're, we're, they're still frightened of, a, uh, of an English nation. And I think this goes back historically to a long way in which the English didn't have to be nationalistic. So which had a, it's a positive side in a way. Um, but now we've got to end the, the Brexit narrative, so to speak. And the only way of doing that that I can see is for us to support Scotland being independent in Europe. And one of the things I'm doing now is to support this organisation, which I hope we'll talk about later, a very new and important one growing across the European Union uh, called Europe for Scotland. Uh, and I think that that's possibly the only way. I think then... Uh, if the English will discard this kind of great British uh, sort of sub-imperial uh, madness that is that is grips their imagination, um, then the best qualities which are still there, the horror that people feel, the shock that people feel, the solidarity that was expressed, not only in England, but in England for the NHS through COVID, the, the desire for a democratic self-government, which was expressed in Brexit, let's take back control, but misplaced the 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 uh, 
uh, the elite that controlled us was not in in uh, in Brussels. It was in Westminster, as we can now see. Uh, so I think that that will happen, and I very much hope, therefore, a process of solidarity with the independence movement in Scotland will help to emancipate England also from yeah. from Westminster. That's one That's of the things that I've been doing. That's very interesting. But I've Can also been writing. I mean, I think, sorry, it was a leading question because I've just finished a book called Taking Control, which I, uh, which is, which it's, it's focused on America, but it's really about is a progressive politics possible? And it, its starting point there, you can see the jacket of a magnificent jacket, which was designed. Um, I looked at that. I thought, yeah, this is really, this is, this is a very powerful way of trying to express the different forces which are at work. And I started to write this book because I was very surprised by two things. One was the way in which Trumpism had, first of all, made voting count and reached out to people, had, had ended fatalism in politics, and then had turned against the American Constitution in on January the 6th with the insurrection, and had, was becoming a kind of white racist supremacist moving towards fascist party in the technical sense. Um, and in doing that, gained the support of the Republican Party and of 40%, 60% of white men in America, 40% of white men didn't, but 60% of white men voted for Trump. So this is a real danger of an authoritarian right wing uh, America, which is very, very alarming. And then to my even as great a surprise, when Biden uh, came in office, he passed this $1.9 trillion American rescue plan. And when he announced it, he openly acknowledged the support of, of uh, Bernie Sanders and of the left. So there was the beginning of something which I have never known in my political lifetime, which is an active uh, alliance or the possible active alliance of the center and the left, which is essential if we are to stop Trumpism. Yeah. So I thought I'd look at why has that come about, given that the left that I come from, the democratic left that I've come from, not only in the UK, but across the world has been crushed and defeated and marginalized and sat upon. Them. Um, where is the strength come from? Which means that there was a 7 million majority, a plurality for Biden, uh, despite the pathetic weakness of the American center and of sort of Clintonism and Blairism. Where did this where did this come from? That's what I asked myself. And I looked for the forces of what I call the forces of humanization, feminism, um, anti-racism, human rights, the role of science in making us much more conscious of our bodies and of each other, which you saw in COVID, the independence movements, which we're now seeing, for example, in Ukraine, but also saw in, in Scotland, the desire for self-government, which doesn't yet have a politics uh, in the more official sense but which is very very profound and means that there are grounds for hope against the the rise of the right and indeed i think one of the reasons why we see xi in china and modi in india and trump in the united states and bolsonaro and johnson is they know how powerful the democratic forces are that if they had the chance would end corruption, would end their media monopolies, would end the domination of corporate power. And they're more aware of our strength uh, than we are. Yeah. And this is one of the arguments that I try to look at in the book and try to do how do we develop this, this strength? How this do is, we... This is, do... this is very interesting. I think what we'll do is we'll take a, a, a look at a short clip in, 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 from your time in Washington DC when you spoke to a number of progressive leaders and at the end right. you, you sort of summarized in, in many respects what you've just been saying. Let's take a quick look at that Kevin if you can uh, if you can key it up. Shift the boundaries of the possible. Given the historic defeat of the left perhaps we should first ask how come they're even strong enough to mount such a challenge. In taking control, I suggest that below the huge incoming tide of marketization, countercurrents of humanization always resisted it. Feminism, environmentalism, anti-racism, and demands for basic rights were all part of this. So too is the transformation of health and bodily awareness recently redoubled by COVID. 
Also, digital technology has broken the media monopoly. It would have been impossible to make a film like this 25 years ago, and it makes active participation feasible. But if the contest in America was simply about democracy, I show that recent history tells us the progressives will lose. But the climate crisis demands popular agency as well as far-sighted good government. So too does meeting the pressures of the need to compete with China. While the horrors of the authoritarian alternative now being enacted by Putin in Ukraine show us the price of failure. It's a complete contrast to the era when we were told there is no alternative to market domination and that government is the problem. Here's the twist though. It was Trump who first shattered fatalism and made voting count. Now, the old, often corrupt, liberal centre can't force us back into passive acquiescence. Perhaps it is true to say that the Civil War never really went away in the United States. And the consequence of Trump's recklessness is that now it must be resolved. Will the nationalist authoritarians or the multiracial Democrats be the victors? The US and therefore the world is on a knife edge. Either progressives change America for good or Trumpism will. My visit to Washington confirms that provided the center allies with progressives, they have the capacity and the abilities to succeed. Excellent. Excellent. That was very good. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate that. That, that chimes rather neatly Thank you. with some of, some of the questions we're getting. Uh, uh, we have a question here. It says, could Anthony please comment on how many voters may be disqualified from voting? owing to a lack of photographic proof of identity. Yeah, well, this is a very good point. I, I, um, I just want to say about that film that it follows uh, interviews with three leading US progressive politicians um, who are in very significant positions of authority and, and one or possibly two of whom may be potential presidential candidates uh, mm -hmm. in the next two, two to eight years. Um, so there is a very articulate and intelligent uh, generation of U.S. progressives below the Biden, Elizabeth Warren, the people that are in their 70s and my generation, um, coming up in American politics, writing books, uh, uh, organizing extremely well, very articulate. Now, this question of voter suppression is an absolutely central one. And the relationship in America between democracy and, and race is absolutely central to what is happening. And one of the things that the, um, happened in America immediately after Trump lost the election, which is very striking, was that the right-wing think tanks looked at this vote and they said, there's only one way that we can continue to govern. And that is if we suppress the votes. We are only supported by a minority and we have to institutionalize voter suppression. And this American playbook has been shipped by Johnson and Company into this country, who've now imposed through Parliament ID cards, the, the, the presentation of ID cards at, in the voting booth, which is estimated could move one to one and a half million people from the effectively being able to vote. And what is, there are two things about this, which I think are really chilling. One is, there was an article in Open Democracy, which I'm the co-founder of, uh, by David Davis, who is a right-wing MP, a pro-Brexiteering MP, but who's a man in favour of liberty. And he said, this legislation is an outrage because it's, it isn't, does not address any problem in terms of voter security and looking after the vote system that exists in the in UK. You know, there almost no, there's no, it, it doesn't, it's, the idea that we need voter ID to secure the safety of our votes is nonsense. Its only role is to suppress the actual number of people who can vote, and therefore he voted against it. Now, what's important is he was a Tory. This wasn't some lefty making a protest, and he's widely respected, and he's a Brexiteer. 
And yet, the vast majority of Conservative MPs voted for this legislation. And nobody was able to defend it in its own terms. So they all knew, they all knew that they were actually passing legislation which would suppress democracy in Britain. That's the first really chilling thing. And the second really chilling thing, if I may say so, is that the Labour Party should have said when that happened, the first week we are in office, we will reverse this. We are Democrats. You will have your vote. We will secure your vote. We will not tolerate this. And there was silence. I mean, they voted against it, but there was no anger. There's no commitment. They did not make it an issue. And so your question is quite right to raise it. But the question is, why is it? Why aren't we all talking about this? This is, you know, our, our democracy being hollowed out deliberately, coldly, callously uh, by a corrupt and lying government. And the opposition says almost nothing about it. Well, here's a supplementary. Uh, the same questioner, Ashbury Stumble, is asking, how, how much would you agree with Mary Black MP who said in the House last week that Britain is on the slippery slope towards fascism? Well, I watched that speech. I thought it was magnificent. I was shocked by how few people there were in the House of Commons when she said it. Um, and uh, she's kind of right. Uh, um, I, I, it, the... The sort of fascism that we will have here, if it succeeds, will be different from the United States. It will be our own particular kind of fascism. But the um, the reason why I think that she's right to make this alert, and she's putting it very well, is this, that the, the checks and balances which historically existed in Britain go back to the 19th century. And what they did quite consciously was that the ruling elite who did not like democracy, they didn't want to have the, but they wanted a system which organized consent. But they also wanted a form of government which would protect them from Bonapartism. It was consciously a system which said we must be able to have a peaceful exchange and changes of government. It was a system which said, we have a large army, we have a large military, we must make sure that they can't take over. So the idea that, that these, the rules, the, the moral, the sense that there were ways in which people behaved, which were proper and, and consensual and orderly and honest, and you didn't lie to parliament, for example. These rules were put in place to, to protect us from Bonapartism. And it's these rules which are now being shattered by, they started with the Thatcher government, it was intensified by the Blair government, which has a big responsibility for what's happening, and originated the whole, it, the, 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 the role of deceit in, in the exercise of power, open deceit, and is now being pushed to, new, to a new level by the uh, Johnson regime. And if Johnson survives, everybody knows he's lied to Parliament. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that what Parliament, the rules of Parliament says, if a minister says something which is untrue, they are under an obligation to go to the House of Commons immediately that they realise this to correct the record. Johnson never did this. So he's in clear breach, whatever the party gate and the unpopularity is, he's in clear breach of the most fundamental informal check on against British dictatorship. And if he gets away with that, then we are, it is completely justified of Mary Black to have issued that warning. But isn't, isn't the problem here in, encapsulated in what you just said? He broke the informal rule, i.e., he, he knew <laughs> that this was merely a convention. He doesn't recognize convention. And no, it's not quite I, that, I, John, because these I, rules, the these rules want, aren't moral. Sorry. No, well, yeah, I agree. But the point I want to put is this. Had Charter 88 been able to uh, implement its recommendations, there would have been a written constitution to which he would have been answerable. 
So that it wouldn't have been an informal rule. It would have been a categorical rule. And he would have no choice. Because well, this, this, this is a very, away. very, very interesting point. I mean, it's not... I think the, the rule that, that a minister must go to parliament, I'm confident that the rule that a minister must go to parliament if they have misled parliament to correct the record immediately is written down. It is actually a rule. And what no, you're no, seeing my point, now... My point is a, is a different one. The, the yeah, but, person, no, but the, even the constitutional rules, the point, the danger of Trump is that Trump started breaking the constitution quite knowingly and because yeah. he had so much political support, he got away with it. So all constitutions, and it's a really important point, I, the reason why we want to have a democratic constitution is because it's a way of saying the country belongs to us. It's yes. a way of empowering us as citizens. Exactly. It's a way of saying we're not... But it won't... We, 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 the people, still have to want a democratic process and we if if uh so what i'm saying is that no rules are only as good as the people who carry them out and it's not the case that any sorts of words will substitute for how we actually behave if the if 40 to 50 percent of the population say excuse the language f off with the constitution as may be happening in america then it will break. It, it, the, the Constitution, so it's not that it's not written down, which is affecting, which is the important point. It's the, the important point of having a democratic constitution of the kind we argue for in Charter 88 is it would democratize our culture and it would democratize us and it would, it would democratize and it would shift the political culture of our politicians and it would have proportional representation and therefore they would have to learn to work with each other if you have a winner takes all culture as we have then you are asking for uh, the kind of potential dictatorships that we have suffered under blair and now under johnson yeah i think the broader point was uh let's say for example somebody does breach a convention written down as you say if if the custodian of that convention is the very person who's broken it then there is no place you can appeal. You can't go to, who, for example, let, let's take, the, and it is the case that the man went to Parliament and lied. We all know that. Yeah. So where, where does Joe Public go and say, right, I want this person removed? They can't. There's no way to go. They're completely at the mercy of the 80 majority of Conservative MPs. And they, they decide if Johnson has broken the rules or not. There's, there's no, there's no public view. Yeah, they all know that he's broken the rules. They all, I mean, the this is the, uh, uh, the, 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 it's a moral point, right? Are they custodians of a, uh, of a rule-based, law-based democracy, or are they the custodians of a, a sort of a, an arbitrary? an uh, authoritarian government that can get away with whatever it can get away with. I mean, it's a fundamental choice about what kind of country they think we are. And it will come, there will be another round after today where Parliament will have to assess itself whether Johnson has in fact breached the rules of Parliament. And, and you know, it is a test for the, these guys. Uh, uh, and there will be a test for the electorate. And one of the pathetic things that I think is happening is that the opposition is not making the argument that you're making. They're not, they're not calling for a better democracy. They're calling for a Brexit that works, you know, which is actually Brexit is a car crash, so it can't work. So th th you get this, this terrible sense that they're hoping somehow or other that the system will default back to I don't know wherever it is the 1990s, um, and we're and 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 and, and so uh, I am as critical in a way of the Labour Party for failing to pose the language. This is why Mary Black's speech was so good because you know at least somebody was saying what needed to be said. There was another speech, for example, by Caroline Lucas. She stood up after with the height of the Ukraine war and she made this following, which I was a really, really devastating speech because it was so forensic. She said, look, 
We have a prime minister who says he's anti, look what's going on with Russia. After the Salisbury poisoning, he went to a uh, NATO meeting at Brussels. He produced the evidence which showed that the Russians were behind the poisoning. Sanctions were then applied on Russian security officials across all of the West, uh, in, in embassies across the West. And then he dismissed, going from, he dismissed his security guards and went to a party in Northern Italy held by somebody who had been working in an ex-KGB agent. And she said, did he carry with him his papers from that uh, uh, meeting? Were these security papers on his telephone? What happened in that event in Italy? Very forensic, very precise, completely proper questions, which of course, they just said, it's Caroline Lucas, I'm not going to, uh, they were ignored. It shouldn't be, those questions should have been asked by the official leader of Her Majesty's opposition. They should have been asked so that Johnson had to answer them because they were right, right au point. And, well, and, I so, want to, I want to, I want to, and it's striking, I want to. if I may say the last thing, that there's two women MPs, right? Yeah, exactly. However marginal the male things may feel they are, who are articulate, precise, name what to, was going on and are ignored. Absolutely, they were both commendable. Um, I, I want to extend the, 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 the point that you made earlier, uh, in which you said the Conservative MPs have to decide if they're going to abide by some sort of moral code that the rest of us recognise, or to abandon that. Let's assume democratic, that yeah, democratic code, yeah, it's a absolutely. democratic code, yeah. Let's, let's assume that they choose the latter. What do you think the outcome of that will be? I, if they continue to support a man that a whole country thinks is a liar, what do you think the outcome will be? Well, I suspect that Johnson can't be re-elected. So I think that, uh, um, I, I just think people have had enough of him. They've seen through him. They they, they thought he was, you know, they knew he was, a, you know, they knew what he was like. They thought he was the chancellor, but they kind of believed that he would be okay with us, that he trusted us, that he trusted the people, that he was like us, that he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do what he did everybody else to us. And they now have learned, oh, you know, his irredeemably a wicked and appalling character, sloppy, lying, self-seeking and, and corrupt. Okay, so I don't think they will be able to win an election. Uh, the problem that we will then face is that the opposition at the moment, in my view, uh, in England, doesn't have an alternative national story. It doesn't have an alternative. Making Brexit work is not an alternative. Trying to be a good administrator, I'm sure Starmer is a good administrator, is not what the country needs. And therefore, you're likely to have an outcome, something like, I'm old enough to remember 1974, when you get a weak, you've got a weak Labour government under Harold Wilson coming in because everybody had had enough of Heath. So you get a Labour government which is in, it's sort of administering things, but it doesn't really know what it's about, what it's for, why it's there. Uh, and then uh, it will get worse and worse. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't look forward to that, to that outcome. Um, I, I read, I read a, a column in the Times uh, recently uh, in which it was the view was put that many Conservative MPs would actually welcome a change of government because of the mess they think which is going to get much worse. They want Labour to clean up the mess and they are hoping that there will be a minority Labour government, yeah. which will only last a year. And then they can go to the country and say, see, we told you, Johnson was terrible, but we, but we got rid of him. Uh, but you can see if it, by, by what's happened recently that Starmer is even worse, they will say. So therefore you ought to give us yeah, a yeah, crack. Yes, I mean, it, it takes speculation to a, a further point. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think, the, you know, if that were to, what the, the Tory party has a capacity to 
uh, renew itself out of office. It looks very seriously. This is what happened with Thatcher after 1974. And uh, if you had the Conservative Party under a new leadership, then it's perfectly capable of sitting there and saying, well, you know, we were brave enough to go for Brexit. It obviously hasn't worked. So we're going to reapply to join the European Union and uh, uh, split away the Liberal Democrat and, and centrist and democratic support and the European support for Europeans and leave Labour holding the Brexit baby. I mean, they're perfectly capable of doing that. <laughs> I think the other concern that people have is the total blanket and unequivocal uh, opposition by the Labour Party to any sort of deals. I mean, for example, they, they don't need to win any seats in Scotland. All they have to do is to say to the SNP, uh, let's sit down and chat. We'll do a bit of horse trading uh, and we're looking for your support once we get in. But there's nothing of that kind. Where's the statesmanship that you would expect in these parlous times? Well, Labour faces a very, um, it's a word I don't like using very much because it's overused, and, but it is a kind of existential question. And you could say, and I think it's reflected in a different way within Scotland itself, which is that there's, um, you make a distinction that David Marquand wrote in his history of Britain since 1918. He said that on the right or centre right, there are two different traditions. There's Whig imperialism and Tory nationalism. And then on within the left, there's what he called uh, uh, democratic collectivism and democratic republicanism. And the republican tradition, which if you like, goes back, uh, the only time it was in office was when Milton was secretary to the cabinet uh, under Oliver Cromwell. Um, but it's a long-standing tradition, which I suppose you would say, and he does, that Charter 88 was part of, which is that people themselves should be uh, um, you know, empowered. And and uh, Labour was part of what he calls this democratic collectivism. It's a different way of putting this kind of Labour. It's the view which is that they've got to run the state from the centre. And this view, it's sort of this Labourist view of what the party is about, is deeply embedded in the machinery. Our job is to gain state power and run run the government, run the country as a party in power. It's a winner-takes-all mentality. And that's deep, deep in the Labour Party. And and the country has moved on. I mean, that's clear in Scotland and in Wales and in Northern Ireland, but it's also clear with the growing support for the Greens and the Liberal Democrats and, and indeed, in a way, for Brexit, which is about let's take back control, i.e. let's, underneath it was this impulse that we don't want to be run by these guys in this paternalistic fashion. And Labour has got to break from this. And 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 Blair constant, Blair, if you like, modernised that centralising tradition. He got rid of the proletarian aspect. He marginalised the trade unions. But, but he centralized, hyper say, broke cabinet government, something I document in a book called The Lure of Greatness, and, and the Iraq war came out of what, what he was able to, to achieve. So he laid the foundations for the centralization that we're now seeing under Johnson. And the great mistake, the tragedy, if you like, of Starmerism is that he's brought Mandelson, who was one of the architects of what Blair did, back in as an advisor. And, and the same kind of what I called at the time manipulative corporate populism, except it's not even popular anymore, um, is it, it, can't, it can't resolve the way forward, but it's intrinsically opposed to, uh, uh, to the kind of democratic shifts. And PR, proportional representation, is the, the talismanic, is the most important reform because it means it's saying we're happy to work in a coalition, if that's what voters want, right? Proportional representation doesn't mean there has to be, there can't be single. You've seen, you know, in Scotland, you've had proportional representation and you've had single party government under the SNP. So proportional representation isn't about enforcing coalition. It's giving power to the voters. And yeah. the great tragedy, if I could go back, one of the tragedies of the Labour Party is that Corbyn, who was, you know, in some ways, a candidate of the left, refused to embrace PR. 
the left the, the left refused to embrace the most fundamental democratic reform of the British state. Uh, uh, and, and had they done so wholeheartedly, it would have been much more difficult for Starmer to have defaulted back to his kind of Blairite, the Blairite legacy. Yeah, there's, just, there, there's sort of an inevitability about all of this. I mean, Blair introduced, ironically, proportional representation to every country part, apart from England. Uh, i.e. the House of Commons remained. <laughs> yeah, England does it, not England. It, it's sort of to England, Britain, Anglo Britain, because England yeah. itself, I speak this as an Englishman who is, you know, deep. We don't have a parliament. We don't have any political, uh, we don't have any organization to express our, 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 our interests as a, as a nation. So you don't with agree the, with Boris Johnson, who said that uh, Westminster is the English parliament? Um, historically, the House of Commons, the House of Commons was the English Parliament, and his and and in the future, I hope the House of Commons. It's a very nice term, the Commons, will become the English Parliament. But at the moment, Parliament is uh, uh, a British institution, and the House of Lords, so-called House of Lords, is not really a House of Lords. It's a House of Cronies. Uh, is a very British institution. And that institution, as we all know, is now corrupt. It's not just that it's badly designed and it's got problems and so on. It is, it is, it is living in another world. Yeah. I mean, it is ironic, though, that PR was introduced all over the place, except for the House of Commons. Uh, and, and, and again, yeah, I think he, he didn't have a... It's kind of... It's very interesting, as you see, because... At that time, I was very active with Charter 88 in that time. At that time, because it was about modernization and because you were introducing new representative institutions, um, of course you had to have PR. And, and one of the things that the, 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 the Scottish Labour thought they were doing by having PR, they thought they would, because they were so confident of their domination of Scotland, they thought it would absolutely ensure that the SNP could never become the the governing party so there was a there was a kind of a laborist calculation miscalculation involved but it was also that no no new parliament that is created you go to people if you have a constitution you say to people well, how should we how should we vote people say well i want my vote to count yeah. you know you don't want a situation in which yeah. the labor party in 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 2005 Blair governed with an absolute majority in Parliament on 35% of the popular vote. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah, and it, but it was a missed opportunity. Nobody would design. Nobody went to anybody say, we're well, having a new representative <laughs> institution. How about one where only 35% of the voters can actually yeah. have absolute power? Everybody would say, yeah. well, look, you know, I mean, no, nobody even think of saying it. So uh, and the moment you start to to innovate and what what the tragedy what blair did if you like was that he pushed he refused to bring the reforms that he had together and he pushed them out and yeah. he thought they really didn't matter i think you may remember he said that the scottish parliament was like a parish council it could owe it could raise the income tax by a penny so that was all right he he and 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 he he didn't really he he thought there was something he had to do because he promised to do it but he didn't really believe they would they would matter yeah, yeah, it's a very good point. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Europe for Scotland, Scotland because we've, yeah. we've, we've had Nina and, and Jenna on the show and they were fantastic ambassadors, I have to tell you, for the whole concept of Europe for Scotland. What, what would you like to add to what they said at that time, Anthony? Well, I think the first thing I would say to new listeners and to remind those who saw it is that Andrea is Italian and Nina is German. So Europe for Scotland is run by a young European couple uh, who are the co-directors. And it has a steering group, which includes people like Leslie Riddock and Matthew Zajek, and it includes people who are from Scotland, but it also includes somebody from France and somebody from Italy and a Croat who lives in Italy and an English person. So it's a, it's a growing international network. And one of the things that Nina and Andrea have done is they've opened, they've created a kind of network of ambassadors. So I think I should say to people, 
There are 14,000 supporters of Europe for Scotland. I see the uh, website is up on the screen. Please go to it if you're not a supporter already and sign it. And then you will become part of a growing pan-European movement. And this is what we're calling for, if you like, the most central thing we're calling for is that the European Union should cease thinking of Scottish independence as an internal issue for Britain, and it will only deal with independence, the Scottish desire for what, what, what relationship to an independent Scotland when Scotland has voted for independence. And we're saying, no, Europe now, and we're saying this is Europeans, I may be, I may be no longer a European citizen because I'm a citizen of England, but I still feel myself would be a European. And we're calling upon the European Union to say, you must offer Scotland the terms for how you would welcome an independent Scotland and to help fund and finance the costs of a transition because Scotland was part of the European Union for 47 years. It was taken out of the European Union against its will. It did not vote for Brexit. And Europe has every right to say, we want Scotland back and to put money on the table because otherwise the Anglo-Brits will say, Europe will screw you, you can't afford to leave, and they will use every means they can to bully and frighten people, and, and everybody is practical and is worried about their livelihoods, into mm -hmm. voting against independence. So we would like to open up the issue of independence, because not just because of that's the best way for Scotland to become independent and to have a referendum and to win it, but because it changes the sense of what Europe is about. It, it, it's an appeal based on our values uh, and not just on bureaucratic processes. So that's what we're doing. And how we're doing it is what Nina and Andrea have done is they've, they've gone to the 40 our supporters and they said, do people want to become active ambassadors for Europe, for Scotland? And there are now quite large groups in France, in Germany, in Italy, and beginning in Spain and in some of the smaller countries of the European Union who are networking with each other about how to put the case for Scotland uh, within to their own national leaderships and um, there's a important lobbying group developing in Brussels and how we then lobby the European Parliament to put this on the agenda um, yeah. and and what people the last thing I'd say is I think it's very very important what people in Europe are saying to us is we want to hear from the Scots that they want this help and solidarity. And they don't want to hear from the Scots where well, it's going to be really rather difficult. Yeah. And we're not sure the European Union can do this. So we don't know what to say. We want the Scots to say, no, we want this. And then the solidarity will be very strong and very forthcoming. So we want as many people in Scotland to join and then to appeal, to write to, to email a friend or a colleague or an associate in another European country to say, join us, support us. Uh, we have to change the European narrative with respect to Scotland, uh, both for the sake of Europe and for the sake of Scotland. Well, that, this, this is a good juncture, it seems to me, to flag up the fact that uh, there, there's going to be a monthly show on Indie Live. Uh, where Europe for Scotland will be able to do exactly that, talk to a Scottish audience and perhaps give them some of the messages that you just uh, mentioned just now, Anthony. And as if that weren't enough, let me let me tell everyone watching and listening that there's going to be a special programme on June the 23rd, uh, a live broadcast. Uh, uh, we think it will be, this is the anniversary, if that's the right word, of the Brexit referendum. Uh, and the plan is that uh, interview, members of the campaign from all over Europe will be interviewed and asked about their motivation to help Scotland and then talk a bit about our plan for helping Scotland to rejoin the EU. Uh, as the organisers put it, it's meant to be a very positive day on the anniversary of a, terrible, a very terrible day. Uh, so that's something to look out for, folks. So June the 23rd, put it in your diary right now and you'll hear from some very positive people talking about a positive vision uh, for uh, uh, for Europe, for Scotland. Not to be missed. Put it in your diaries right now, please. 
that's the plug. Oh. <laughs> Great. Well, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. it it's it's going to be marvellous. Uh, and all credit, by the way, sparing his blushes, uh, to our producer, uh, Kevin Gibney, who is the prime mover behind all of this. You know, people come on the TNT show and they talk about some fantastic great ideas and Kevin is there to pick up that some of those uh, ideas and concepts and run with them uh, and that's why we're talking about a monthly show and the special show on June 23rd which again is the and, and I can confirm from brief experience uh, Kevin's technical uh, competence <laughs> and capacity uh, which is very impressive and very very nice very reassuring too he, he's dug me out of a few holes, I can tell you. <laughs> I think I'm a bit shadowed. I'm just going to lift this thing one second. <laughs> now, people might not know this, Anthony, but uh, when we look at the Europe for Scotland uh, cast list, if I can call it that, uh, you've got people like Neil Asherson, who've signed up. You've got William Boyd, Carmen Khalil, You've got uh, Brian Cox, of course, who's been on the show. Uh, yeah. You've got Sam Hewan, who is the actor in uh, Outlander. You've got uh, yeah. Jackie Kay, the Scots backer. You've got A.L. Kennedy. I mean, these are well-known names uh, in Scotland. I mean, these are, these are, I hope I'm not producing them, or, uh, these are heavy hitters. You know, Val McDermott. Uh, not Val McDermott, yeah. You have Ian McEwan, who is uh, uh, not in Scotland, but who's a very oh, good English yeah. writer. Yes, yeah. Well, he, 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 has, he has talked several times. Tom Nairn, of course. And I think you met with Tom recently. Uh, when yes, you Tom is a very old friend. I, I did, I was very proud, I think I should say, uh, uh, because I am very proud, I did the introduction to the new um, edition of uh, uh, The Breakup of Britain. Which I can I can show you because I don't think that Kevin has, has got it on the screen. There it is. Oh, there we are. Uh, and and that's a new edition from Verso, and I did the introduction to it. And I've done a longer article in Open Democracy about the relationship of Tom Nairn to Gordon Brown, and their history going back to the Red Paper on Scotland in 1975, um, and and also the development of Tom's own arguments around the importance and significance of nationalism yeah. and with respect to socialism. And Tom and Gordon Brown have come to two very different views on the future of Scotland. Does that surprise you? Well, it goes right back to the red paper. And uh, so part of the, the, the article in Open Democracy um, is a long discussion of what, of what happened. Um, and it's quite striking that the 40-year-old, the I think he was at 1975, uh, uh, Nairn, who was the sort of a master of European thought, um, was given the lead article. And there was a book Tom Nairn, uh, uh, Gordon Brown edited, the young Gordon Brown, aged sort of 23 or something, edited, and it was his first publication, uh, a book called The Red Paper on Scotland, uh, and um, uh, I've, got, I've got my copies a bit behind me. It's now bleached in the, it's, it was very cheaply produced. Because that was good, partly because of the financial crisis. 23% inflation, in, annual inflation in 1974. Um, and and um, there were about 25 contributors to the red paper on Scotland, all of them men. Uh, but the lead contributor, uh, which followed after Gordon Brown's young ed editor's introduction was was Tom, and Brown sort of notes his disagreement. He feels that Nan is involved in a kind of pessimism against the idea that Britain can be reformed. So there's a, a very strange relationship. And then Tom, when he looked back after 25 years on the Red Paper. Uh, obviously, he was very, very hostile to the way in which Brown tried to save the British state. But he acknowledges um, his role as a creative leading figure, bringing people together and, and his intellectual capacity. And he says in a rather striking phrase, we would welcome him back on deck. So uh, both, both, I think, in a, in a strange way, both 
both uh, Gordon Brown and Tom Nairn are still hoping that they will win the other to their uh, to their argument. And um, my own view on it, if I put it in a summary, is that one of the ways in which Tom Nairn influenced Brown is that he said from that very early period that the, the only future for Scottish nationalism that was worth having was one inside the European Union and the European process. It wasn't called the European Union then. And he said Europe, not because he didn't think that Europe was a capitalist project, but because he said that it's, it was the terrain of reality and the future. And that was the terrain where le the left and socialists had to be if they were going to make any progress. And so he developed an argument about the nature of Scottish nationalism as being something which needed to be part of a larger process, a larger union. He argued against, he always understood the dangers within nationalism of exclusivity and narrowness. But he also said that nationalism can be uh, civic and, and inclusive and weird, even to use a word of Rory Scothorns, and, 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 uh, and open. And that meant that when Gordon Brown started to uh, uh, confront the question of, 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 of how Scottish voice and the meaning of Scotland, because he remains a very patriotic Scotsman, he understood that Scotland could be Scotland while being part of a larger union. Uh, his argument is that that larger union has to be Britain because that was the trajectory of power that he desired. So he's always said Scotland is Scotland inside a larger union. But that argument, oddly enough, although it's pitched against Tom Nairn's desire for independence, was influenced by the Nairn argument that nationalism and the union and the larger union could go together. And now with Brexit, a right wing English-driven Anglo-British project which wants to squash Scottish independence on hopes that at a certain point Brown will understand that his argument that Scotland can only be itself as part of a larger union makes sense in the European level, not the UK level. Very interesting point. I'd love to have Gordon Brown on the show so we can actually put some of these questions to him. But uh, uh, maybe that's a reach. I don't know. Maybe that's a stretch. But that would be good, I think. If you, I'll ask, to, him to, I'll ask him to watch this uh, program. Yes, please do. He'd be very welcome. And we don't bite. We're very open and uh, and uh, and we try to be as all embracing as we can. Um, I, I wanted to because we're running out of time. I'm afraid we've only got about seven minutes left. Um, what do you see as the future, Anthony, for open democracy? For, for the website of democracy or no, for, for the, for the, or the or whole for concept democracy itself. Democracy. Where do you see it going from here on in? Well, I, uh, that is a big question. So what I try to write about in the, um, uh, at the, in the final chapter of Taking Control is to sketch out one, some of the issues which progressives will have to address. And if you like, one of the central ones is the connection between the great issues of our time, the environment, racial justice, uh, um, the, the question of human rights, and the question of how we govern ourselves as nations in a single planet. Um, and one of the things that I would like to, to, which I discuss and I'd like to sort of, if we're coming to an end, emphasize is that there is um, a general crisis of representative democracy around the world. And one of the things that I argue, I'm not, it's not a particularly original argument, is that representative democracy that we know, the democracy that we experience, was created to organize consensus, but also to keep the state at arm's length from the unwashed. And now people don't trust this state because it's been captured so much by corporate power. And they weren't, our project should not be to re-establish trust. It should be to say people are quite right not to trust the existing state. We have to create forms of democracy in which there's sufficient participation, sufficient engagement. 
that people now feel this belongs to us. So we take the jury system. Not everybody goes on a jury and very few people go on any particular jury, only 12. But still, we know that the the decision of justice in the jury system is taken by our peers, by people like us. And that's one of the reasons why people trust the justice system, more or less. They like the jury system. So we need a we need to develop representative democracy in a way which moves us towards participation, towards a jury type system and towards decentralization that, that the Internet it certainly can make effective. It has very bad aspects, but if it's governed properly, then we can get very good decisions out of this. So, for example, the way in which the Irish came round to uh, uh, to vote in favour of the right to abortion and the right to gay marriage was based on citizens' assemblies taken from a, a, a cross section of the population debating the issues that needed. It was taken outside the political parties, which are incapable of embracing those issues, and then coming back saying, this is, we want this to be a priority, and, and there being a referendum on that basis. If you had a constitutional convention, if you had 100 people selected by lot from in the United Kingdom, and you said, what electoral system should we have? They would go for PR. And if that was then put to a referendum, we would win that referendum. So we need to think about how we change the nature of democracy, not simply in terms of policies, but of its actual manner. And I think if I may say so from outside, looking at what's going on in Scotland, is that it seems to me there's a you have a danger with the SNP, that the SNP, while calling for this kind of rather radical Republican notion of independence, which is has is governing Scotland somewhat it's absorbed or taken imported into Scotland a kind of Westminster centric model uh, it isn't creating mayors in Dundee and in Glasgow and Edinburgh it's not it's not releasing public energy in the way that it's needed it's not it's so even where it has powers I don't feel when I go to Scotland I can understand now it's a fundamentally different political culture uh, uh, to the one that I inhabit in England so there, in a sense, Scotland is in a quite profound way a separate country now, but um, it's not one where uh, the it's it's the self government is all focused on on Nicola Sturgeon. It's all it's the, it's all very very leader centric, and I don't feel the growth of self government in the localities. I don't feel the self of gov I don't feel that Scotland is leading. Uh, the United Kingdom in deepening democratic processes. So I think that that's one of the most important ways in which we need to learn. We need to, how do we democratize regulation? How do we democratize these larger processes that we're all involved in in the modern world? How do we democratize the internet? How do we develop an internet bill of rights as one of the American progressives are arguing about? These are really important matters and Scotland should be contributing to this. this. This should be part of what our public discourse is about and not the narrow nature of the kind of politics that we've inherited, which about which people are really pissed off. Yeah. So we need a, a cult, political culture which touches people's real lives and realities. And they say, oh, that's that, that's I could grow. Like, people need to be able to feel that they can grow within a new political culture. That's the direction that we need. And uh, I think that that's the direction which your own government could pi help to pioneer. I think these are very good, if not excellent points. Thank you very much, Anthony. And thank you Pleasure. for joining us this evening. I hope you'll stick around for a little bit uh, after the show. We can uh, perhaps have a quick chat. I want to tell people that we've that while we, you were on air, we were doing a poll, and this is of course an India Live poll, and we asked people should Scotland be independent, and heavens above, ninety six percent of you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> but also we asked how much do you trust BBC News, and seventy nine percent said never, <laughs> right. eighty percent said sometimes, and one brave soul said always. Uh, that was that was four percent. So there we are. Well, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that this, this poll is in any way profound. Uh, we're simply uh, doing it as a, a little bit of diversion, as it were. Uh, thank you again, uh, Anthony. Pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank and you. I hope Please to see you on the, or watch you on the 23rd of June. <laughs> if I'm around, I'll, I'll be there. Uh, let me just say a few uh, concluding remarks, if I may. 
uh, because I know you've all got things to do tonight. Uh, we're back next week uh, at the same time, and we'll be talking to Yes Highlands. It's a special group that covers a geographical area. Listen to this. Greater than Belgium. <laughs> That's right. A Yes group covering an area greater than Belgium. As always, please look out for my column in the Sunday National this weekend. You'll find it in the seven days supplement. And if you're looking for a special treat for someone dear to you who's interested in how the Commonwealth ended up where it is right now, uh, or perhaps for yourself, let me recommend a great book by my colleague, Elliot Bomer. Uh, uh, and that's it there. Uh, and uh, sorry, it's there we are. Uh, and it's how the Westminster uh, model influenced constitutions across the world. Uh, you can look at it for free. Uh, I hasten to add that because it's £100 if you want to buy it. Uh, and the details are up on the screen or will be shortly. Go on, treat yourself. Why not? I mentioned the new show coming up on June the 23rd, uh, which is all about Europe for Scotland. You really don't want to miss that. And if you forgive me, I want to say a special word to Anthony. Uh, not only has he been a fantastic guest tonight, but he has an operation tomorrow. And I want on your behalf, uh, as well as my own, to wish him good luck tomorrow. Thank you. It's, thank it's you. just for a cat right. So thank you very much indeed. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. To all of you, thanks for joining us tonight. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good night, all.